Hello, welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Rose, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today's speaker is Alexandra Fraze, Program Director of the Manitoba Brewing Owl Recovery Program. Every month, PCAP has someone to present either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in a Saskatchewan community on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. Join us on January 28th at noon for a presentation about loggerhead shrikes with Amy Shabbat of Shrike Watch Canada. To register or find out more information about upcoming or past presentations, please visit the PCAP website. I would like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by TransCanada Corporation, Canada North Environmental Services, Environment and Climate Change Canada, Eco-Friendly Sask, Information Services Corporation, and Wildlife Habitat Canada. In-kind support for today's webinar has been given by the Manitoba Burrowing Owl Recovery Program. A reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard at any time, and questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. And a bit about our presenter, Alexander Fraze is the Program Director for the Manitoba Burrowing Owl Recovery Program. She began her career working with wildlife in Manitoba back in 2007, where she volunteered her time as a piping plover guardian and helped band great gray owls alongside Dr. Jim Duncan and Ken Desmet with Manitoba Sustainable Development. Alex moved into the role of program coordinator for the Piping Plover Program in 2008 as she finished her final year of her undergraduate degree in environmental studies. Working with the Piping Plover Program, she discovered her passion for endangered species work. In 2010, Alex began her graduate studies at the University of Winnipeg with a focus in wildlife biology and specifically on the endangered burrowing owl. Alex created the Manitoba Burrowing Owl Recovery Program in 2013 with the cooperation of several program partners and has continued working in southwestern Manitoba, reintroducing burrowing owls into the wild, collecting breeding ecology data on both captive release and wild owls, and educating the general public and landowners on the importance of improving habitat for burrowing owls through grassland conservation, and the installation of artificial nest burrows. Alex was selected as CBC Manitoba's Future 40 in 2017 for her involvement in establishing the Manitoba Burrowing Owl Recovery Program. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Alex. Alex, if you can hear us, you're welcome to go ahead. Great. Thanks so much, Caitlin, for the warm welcome and introduction. And thank you to everyone who has joined in to listen to my talk about burrowing owls today. Again, my name is Alex Fries, and I'm the program director of the Manitoba Burrowing Owl Recovery Program, or MBORP. I'm going to start the talk off with some background on burrowing owls and then get into some breeding ecology and then some specifics about our program. The burrowing owl is a small ground dwelling owl that nests in excavated burrows. They cannot dig their own nest or burrow and rely on digging mammals like badgers, foxes and ground squirrels and prairie dogs to dig burrows for them. Burrowing owls can do some renovation, maintenance to the burrow by digging some dirt, adding grass and cow manure to line the nest, but they cannot excavate the entire burrow themselves. So fossorial mammals that I mentioned are very important to burrowing owls. The owl breeds in Canada and the, and the US, and generally they're found in grassland and agricultural habitats in Manitoba. Here we have the current range map of the burrowing owl in North America. There are two subspecies in North America. The western burrowing owl, which occurs throughout western Canada, so all in this green area and the little dot there in southwestern Manitoba, 
all the way through the United States and into Mexico. And also uh, the other subspecies is the Florida burring owl. So I'm sure you can guess where you can find the Florida burring owl in Florida over here. Canadian burrowing owls are migratory and leave the Canadian prairies generally in September through November and then return to Canada for breeding in the spring, March, generally through May. Breeding begins in April and May in Manitoba. It can be earlier in other parts of Canada and the United States. They have a high level of reproduction producing over a dozen eggs in a single clutch. Eggs hatch asynchronously. This means that the eggs do not hatch all out at once and hatch out over several days. The female generally lays three to four eggs before beginning regular incubation. She produces an egg every 24 to 36 hours. The first three to four eggs generally hatch all within 24 hours and the others hatch as they were laid and incubated. This can create up to a week or more difference in hatch dates for young in the brood. Survival of the last hatched is poor as they are not strong and as they're, they're not as strong as their older siblings and have trouble competing for food. In seasons where food supply is good, more young will survive, which can include the last hatch of the clutch. Now time for some adorable pictures of burrowing owls. The first photo on the left here is a three day old burrowing owl weighing in at a whopping 12 grams. Burrowing owl eggs are approximately the size of a ping pong ball and a freshly hatched young uh, weighs in around eight grams. So I generally tell people that's the weight of eight paper clips. From day one to 10, young cannot open their eyes and are unable to thermal regulate. They are completely dependent on their parents for food and stay in the nest burrow. The second photo here on the right is a young at 10 days old and 38 grams. At 10 to 14 days old, they begin to open their eyes and start to venture out into the world above the ground, out of the burrow. On the left, we have a young that's two and a half weeks old and 125 grams. At two to three weeks of age, they begin to look more like a burrowing owl. Their colored feathers are growing in. You can see the yellow in the eye here. And they weigh within the range of an adult. An adult burrowing owl can range between 125 to 190 grams. Uh, on the right, we have a five week old burrowing owl that has just been banded and is at weighing in at 150 grams. Between five and six weeks of age, the owlets can sustain flight, they're considered fledged, and start moving around to nearby satellite burrows. They are independent from their parents after they are six weeks old. So I'm going to play a few calls for you all here. I'm going to have to minimize my screen and bring up a little call here. Um, but the first one we have is the male territorial call. Males project this call or call this call when they're defending territory from another male uh, and also to attract a female companion in the breeding season. The second call I'm going to play is a typical alarm chatter, which all burrowing owls make when they're feeling threatened and, or when a predator is nearby the burrow. Thank <laughs> you. 
The last call I'm going to play is a juvenile call from juvenile burrowing owls. Uh, burrowing, young burrowing owls will hide in the nest burrow when a predator is nearby and make a rattlesnake type call out of the burrow to scare a uh, potential intruder away. So what challenges are burrowing owls facing in Canada? First and foremost is the loss of habitat. The development of roads, housing, large scale farming and energy exploration have reduced and eliminated suitable habitat for burrowing owls. Also prey shortages occur in cool and wet seasons. Prey species are limited during these times and play a major role in the success and the survival of both adults and young. The use of pesticides. Pesticides affect prey species abundance. If there is less food, then there's less owls around. Uh, this also reduces nesting, hatching, and fledging success of young. Also, if burrowing owls eat poisoned prey, this can bioaccumulate in their body and result in death. And last but not least, uh, migration. Winter mortality is extremely difficult to measure in a long distance migrant that does not show a high fidelity to their nest site. Little is known about the migration path of burrowing owls migrating to and from Canada presently. However, high mortality is suspected for young in their first year. The burrowing owl is listed uh, federally as endangered throughout Canada and is also provincially listed as endangered throughout Western Canada, British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. In Manitoba, the species population declined by 82% from 1982 to 1987. Due to the steep population decline, the government of Manitoba began reintroductions in 1987 through 1996. There were some slight increases in 88 and 89, however, drastic decline followed with only one known pair in the province in 1996. The species was essentially extirpated in Manitoba from 2000 to 2005 with zero reports and observations. The future of burrowing owls seemed bleak at this point, but not all hope was lost when there was a resurgence of 35 nesting pairs found in southwestern Manitoba in 2006 through 2009. The next year, I began my study on burrowing owls in southwestern Manitoba, and that was in 2010 to 2012 with my study period, and then the start of MBORP in 2013. So MBORP, the Manitoba Burrowing Owl Recovery Program, has three main goals. One is to reestablish a reintroduction program to promote, stimulate, and increase burrowing owl populations in Manitoba. Two, research. What can we learn about the owls to better understand emerging threats? And our biggest question is migration. Where are owls going and why are they not returning? And last but not least, education through public presentations, community events throughout Southwestern Manitoba and connecting with landowners one-on-one -on -one with suitable habitat for burrowing owls to discuss grassland conservation and ways to further improve lands for burrowing owls. So why start a reintroduction program again in Manitoba? We decided to reinstate a reintroduction for two reasons. First, there was the small resurgence of burrowing owls in 2006 through 2009. And second, there have been recent studies across Canada relating to the feasibility of reintroduction of burrowing owls using new techniques. And we wanted to adapt 
some of these techniques into an innovative reintroduction program, program in Manitoba. So how is the 2010 or 2013, however you look at it, uh, reintroduction different than the 1987 through 1996 reintroductions? So first, we only released successful breeders. By releasing only successful breeders, we hope to increase nest site phyllopatry. This is known to increase with age and breeding success, and in turn would increase the returning population in future breeding seasons. Secondly, we held back some young from wild and captive nests. By holding back, some young from both groups promoted the survival of the remaining young left in the wild, there was less competition for food, increasing overall fitness and chances for post-fledging survival. Also, young removed were held back from their first year, or also young that were held back in their first year of migration. As I previously, me previously mentioned, their, um, sorry, uh, so by holding back some young, we increased the overall fitness and chances of post-fledging survival for the young that we left in the wild. And then we removed some individuals and they were held back over winter. And that removed them from that first year migration that we were, um, that we suspect where there's a lot of mortality occurring for first year migrants. Thirdly, we released pairs after they had at least three eggs in their nest to promote a strong pair bond. And we also had, we also installed Reconyx trail cameras at the burrow entrance for all nests. This allowed for activities near the burrow to be monitored 24 hours a day. So here we have a map of Manitoba. I don't have any of the cities or towns highlighted on here, but Winnipeg's around here, and this is the Highway 1, come out here, be close to Brandon, around this area, and here, and then you would travel down Highway 83, coming from Verdon, if anyone's familiar with that area, and our study site and field areas are all within the yellow circle there in the extreme southwest corner of the province. Our release sites were selected based on proximity to recent wild burying owl nests, grazed pasture land, abundance of ground squirrels and burrows, and areas with relatively no trees or shrubs. All of our release sites were on private land. So these are all of our release sites here throughout 2010 through 2018. Not all sites were used in every season. And just to give you reference here, so I talked about Brandon, Winnipeg's off the map over here, this Highway 1, and then I mentioned that Highway 83, you come down, and there's Melita, Manitoba, that's the biggest little town in southwestern Manitoba. Here we have one of our soft release pens. Each pen is eight foot by eight foot, eight, eight feet by eight feet. It is made of two by fours, mesh netting, chicken wire. There's orange snow fencing on the top as well. Pens are anchored down with rope and we use a horseshoe rebar that we've made up ourselves to anchor them down into the ground. Uh, to prevent any type of collapse when strong prairie winds gust. Each pen is equipped with a three bucket artificial nest burrow, a two foot wooden post for owls to perch, and a Reconyx wildlife camera, which I had mentioned that we install in each, um, at each burrow. Not pictured is a perimeter of electric fencing. We put it all the way around. There's one of the posts here, but there isn't any fencing, I guess we were just in the midst of putting it up. We saw an electric fence um, as they're grazing cattle in the fields where we release owls. So 
So the next few slides are going to be talking about artificial nest burrows. So this is an example of one of our reintroduction artificial nest burrows, and we call it a three bucket system made up of two five gallon buckets. So there's only one pictured here, but on the next, oh, the one behind there, sorry. So there's the one here and then two five gallon buckets. There's one 15 gallon bucket, which acts as the nest chamber, this black bucket on the bottom. We have, uh, it's made up of two sections of six inch weeping tile. One section is two feet long and the other section is six to eight feet long here. There's one section of four inch weeping tile and that's about two feet long. And then two couplers to attach the four foot to the six foot, or sorry, the four inch to the six inch. Access to the nest chamber is on the outside of the pen to minimize disturbance to the pair and the female incubating eggs and hatching young. I'll show you that on the next slide. So here is access, so it would be outside of the pen and then the burrow is underground and then you just have the opening of the nest entrance inside the pen. This diagram obviously shows a lot smaller pen than what we have versus eight feet by eight feet. But I wanted to show this just so you can see um, how the buckets sort of insert into each other. So the top bucket is actually inserted into the second bucket, which is attached to the 15 gallon bucket here. And so the second bucket is actually at ground level. And then the third bucket is just inserted and it's filled with dirt so that we're able to just pull it up rather than digging it up all the time for easy access. What you'll likely note from this diagram is that the bottom bucket in this one is not larger than the rest. This is because we switched to a larger bucket just in this past season in 2018. Prior to 2018, we used three five gallon buckets, so they were all the same size. And we used only one section of six inch weeping tile that was eight to 10 feet long. We didn't do that uh, section of four inch in the, in the center or closer to the nest chamber. We changed our burrow design based on issues with predation in 2017. The new 2018 style of burrow is being used in Alberta for Calgary Zoo's Burrowing Owl Head Start program. So here are some photos right from the field. So this is inside one of our release pens. You have the burrow entrance, you have that two foot section of post, wooden post. We adapted our design further and added a two foot section of PVC piping. We have a peeperoo device or a fiber optic camera that allows us to look into the burrow without having to pull up that third bucket all the time. This minimizes the disturbance to the incubating the female who's incubating, also to young, et cetera, when we wanna do some quick nest checks. The photo here shows what it looks like when you do pull up the third bucket, you can see the eggs in the nest chamber. On the bottom, we have set a, a photo of seven newly hatched young. This is in our old burrow design with the five gallon bucket on the bottom. And last but not least, we have five young here who have just been banded and then are gonna be uh, put back into their burrow. And one of our burrows each season, um, we're, we're, we only have one camera that we can place actually in a burrow. So one of our pairs each season gets to be our star for the season and we're able to record um, data for the entire time that they're they're in the burrow uh, so we get all of the nesting data from um, the female as soon as she lays her first egg to the last when hatching starts we're able to um, time out exactly when hatching started um, to when it finishes we can watch the young grow up in the burrow here so i'm going to play this little video here um, there are a total of 
11 young in here and they're all huddled up. You'll see them moving a little bit. You can see the one that has gone all the way around the whole group is trying to get, he or she is trying to get in there. Um, that was the last hatched of this group. And um, we do provide a supplement to all of our nests. Uh, so to the pairs when they're in their pens prior to release, as well as all the way up until young start emerging from the nest. Uh, luckily in this case, uh, we had 100% fledging success, so that young owl um, was able to um, compete for food uh, against some of his or hers older siblings. Um, so it was a great success, this nest for us. For the owls. So we conduct wild owl surveys from May through July in southwestern Manitoba at dawn and dusk, which is generally when burrowing owls are most active. All surveys are conducted by roadside and we use a playback call of the male territorial call to encourage both males and females to react. Our surveys have resulted in the detection of pairs at sites where burrowing owls have not been seen since the 1980s in Manitoba including areas near Deloraine and Cartwright, Manitoba. Here's a map of the area we survey each season. It extends from just north of the US border. So way down here, there's Lyleton. I mentioned Melita before. So Lyleton's down here and the US border is just along here. And we're just west of the Saskatchewan border here. So this is Saskatchewan right here. And we go as far north as Verdon, which is actually off the map here. But we have Highway 2, and you can see Surus here. And we extend our surveys as far east as Boisevain, Manitoba, just above the Turtle Mountain Provincial Park there. Green squares are areas we consider suitable habitat for burrowing owls. So suitable habitat is land that is open, grassland, pasture land with relatively no trees or shrubs, and either obvious burrows or populations of ground squirrels. Yellow squares are areas we consider potentially suitable, which means they are open grassland, pasture land, but they may need burrows or grazing. The red squares are considered unsuitable for burrowing owls, and that's generally cropland or flooded areas. And blue circles are locations where we have detected wild burrowing owls in the last nine seasons. So here is a lot of information. I'm gonna skim through this. Um, I'm not gonna go into great, great detail, but if there's questions about anything, um, we can come back to this, of course, at the end when um, we're all wrapped up and question period is going on. So here we have the nesting results for the last nine years for captive release burrowing owls in southwestern Manitoba. There was a total of 48 pairs of captive release owls that were set up for reintroduction. 35 pairs, so that's 73%, successfully produced nests. Of the 35 initial nests, 13 failed due to flooding, four to abandonments, and four to suspected predation. There were 10 replacement clutches or re-nests, and two of these failed due to flooding and an unknown abandonment. 
there was a total of 22 of the initial 48 pairs, so 50% that fledged young. Increased clutch size was noted in 2013 with the highest number of eggs produced. There was 52 eggs in five nests. A nest in 2012, 12, 16, and 18 were the most successful with a total of 55 young recruited. Overall hatching success for captive release nests was 58% and fledging success was 86% for all nine, nine seasons. Young removed for overwintering are paired and released in the fall se following season. So this is total recruitment here. And then young removed were held over at the Cinnamon Park Zoo for the following season for breeding and release. All captive released and wild burrowing owls are banded with a unique alphanumeric color-coded band and a CWS aluminum band. When we band young, they're around three to four weeks old. We also record their weight and measurements at this time. And we take a small sample for sexing and for genetics work, genetic work. We wanna ensure that we are removing young from nests so that we have a balanced sex ratio for the breeding and release season the next season. And last but not least, our program's third goal is to ed educate the general public about the many challenges that burrowing owls are facing and to engage people in grassland conservation. Our program is lucky to have a wonderful live burrowing owl education owl called Coco. Coco is a five-year-old imprinted owl from the Saskatchewan Burrowing Owl Interpretive Center. And she came to Manitoba in December of 2013 and she's since participated in hundreds of presentations with our staff. She's raised awareness about her species decline and she's helped our program raise thousands and thousands of dollars. Our program relies completely on private public funding and donation, so her importance to our program um, has been phenomenal. Coco has helped raise um, not only helped raise um, money, but obviously awareness about her species decline. We celebrate her hatch day. So I've got some little photos here. We celebrate her hatch day in the community in Melita. Uh, we invite anyone out um, to come and participate in her hatch day and we have cake. And there's pictures, people can take pictures with Coco and one of our staff. Uh, we do an owl craft as well. It's a great way for us to connect with the community and there's cake so that's pretty delicious so it's great each season we participate in melita banana days so that's what this photo is of this large banana <laughs> people might wonder why burrowing owls with a banana uh, in manitoba many rural towns have a town statue that in some cases is the, is the town's pride and joy Melita, Manitoba, has been referred to as the banana belt of Manitoba, as it's generally warmer than other places in the province. So hence the large banana wearing a belt in the corner photo. Um, every, every year, the town has a festival called Banana Days. So we participate in that. We have an info booth. We bring Coco out and we do a craft with the community as well as a presentation to talk to the general public and landowners about improving habitat for burrowing owls. In September this past year, we participated in the Manitoba Open Farm Day event. And that's the photo up in the corner here. Uh, we were able to highlight one of our private landowners and their partici participation in our program, which is really great. We also focus much of our time connecting with landowners and working with them one-on-one -on -one to improve habitat for burrowing owls, which includes the installation of artificial nest burrows on suitable habitat, which, and artificial nest burrows create protected homes for returning burrowing owls in the area. 
We encourage landowners to become stewards on their land and participate in an annual survey to detect burrowing owls and other grassland species on their lands. So our landowner stewardship program is completely voluntary. It's a handshake or, writ uh, or written stewardship. Um, we haven't had any um, complaints uh, over the years about anybody who's participated in it. Uh, which is really great and we've installed almost 200 artificial nest burrows on private lands and we've worked with over 40 uh, individual private landowners in the last that's from 2013 to 2018. And last but not least I'd like to thank everybody here for their time today uh, listening to our, my talk. I really appreciate the opportunity to do this with PCAP. So thank you, Caitlin, for reaching out to me. I also want to graciously recognize the organizations that have supported both my research and our ongoing efforts with MBORP. Without their support, our program would not exist and could not continue. And if you want further information about our program, first of all, this is a photo of our Coco, our ambassador. Uh, you can find more information on our website. You can follow, all oh, this is cut off here a bit, but it's coco.theowl on Instagram. We have a Facebook page. We're posting things all throughout the season about what we're doing. If you want to help burrowing owls, you can donate through the link here. Uh, and this, this money specifically goes towards MBORP and the work we're doing in Manitoba. Um, if you, don't get the link down. You can also look up Turtle Mountain Conservation District. That's one of our program partners and they're accepting donations for MBORP and all donations are tax deductible. And with that, I can take some questions. Thank you very much. That was an awesome presentation. Um, we have a few questions um, in from listeners already. The first one is from a listener named Stephen, who would like to know um, what is the loss of pra prairie grassland in this area of Manitoba? Uh, like a percentage of that? I, yeah, I wouldn't you know. know. Yeah, okay. I wouldn't know for some okay. for percentage, but um, the loss would be, I mean, you see it even throughout the nine years that I've been doing this, you see that, you know, grassland or pasture land has been converted. Um, we also had about four years of the last nine that we've had extreme summer storm events. And so areas are just been flooded out and haven't ever recovered. So things that are definitely changing. I wouldn't have a, I wouldn't have an exact number, but I could definitely look that up and get back to Stephen okay. or get back to you. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Um, the same listener would also like to know, um, what seems to be the range needed per pair of owls? Oh, that's, yeah, a good question. So burrowing owls actually don't mind hanging out together. We say that they like to nest in loose colonies. So um, I've actually, in my very first year in 2010, there were three pairs within probably 500 yards from each other in one pasture. So they don't need that much room. Um, the male will definitely let you know if you're another male or coming into their territory. Um, but yeah, I would say 500, 500 yards, meters around that. Yeah, it, they, they don't mind hanging out close together. Interesting, thank you. Um, a listener named George would like to know, or he says you had a surprise of 30 pairs after they were thought to be gone. Um, and he would like to know where do you think that they came from or were they just missed? Um, so I don't think that they were missed because we do have um, a biologist with the government of Manitoba that's very thorough uh, working in southwestern Manitoba and, and doing uh, breeding surveys for not only burrowing owls, but other threatened grassland species. So um, it could be that there were more reports from landowners that that could part, partly be. Um, but the, um, the weather was really great. We were about three, three or four years there that were quite dry. And burrowing owls seem to like it when it's a little bit drier. One of their main food sources is grasshoppers. So 
um, when it's dry, there's lots of grasshoppers around. So I, I think that it's because of the weather and um, how things were those years, but I don't know where they would have come from. None of them, I can let you know that for sure, none of them were previously banded. So they didn't come from another reintroduction program or they weren't banded in Saskatchewan or Alberta because none of them had bands. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. Um, it kind of actually leads to the next question by a listener named Jeff. Um, have banded owls returned to Manitoba? Have you found any banded owls coming back? Yeah, so um, our program is very small scale. Like we're releasing maximum 10 pairs a year. Um, so even to get one return out of 100 owls is a great success because they're a migratory species. There's lots of challenges they're facing along migration that, you know, they just might not be making it back, uh, period, right? They're not surviving or maybe they're finding a stopover point that they prefer to then coming all the way back to Canada. But we have had um, three wild males return to the exact pasture where they were nested successfully the year before. And then we've had one captive release young return to its natal burrow the following season. So that was a great success for us. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, that's pretty awesome. There's a listener here named Michael who'd like to know, um, so you said that Western Brewing Owls Eastern Point easternmost point in Canada is at the western edge of Manitoba and he's wondering if the Fort White alive spurring owl population is not technically int introducing like an invasive species being that it's outside of their range. Do you know anything about that population? Yeah so Fort White alive they had a few individuals in their um their exhibit and there were two, there's a male and a female in there and they produced a nest two years in a row. And those adults were from Alberta and those young that were produced in those two years, some of them were actually placed in our reintroduction program. So some of those young were released or paired with some of the individuals in our group and then released. They are still considered a part of the prairie population of Manitoba of Canada. So there is no issue um, reintroducing them in our group. Fort Wade Alive doesn't reintroduce owls on their land themselves. So they just have owls within an exhibit that um, the public can come to visit and learn about burrowing owls. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think so. Michael, if you're listening there, just let us know if you have any more questions about that topic. Um, there is a listener here named, um, oh, sorry, we have lots of questions coming in, which is awesome. Um, a listener named Bill would like to know, what would a target be for population recovery? Is there an opportunity to use catch and breed preservation sites, um, like within secure zones, like the, the Winnipeg airport? Hmm. So the Winnipeg airport wouldn't support habitat or burrowing owls like the current range of the burrowing owl is just the extreme southwest corner of the province the furthest east we've seen a burrowing owl in the last i guess it's going on 40 years is um I, there was one report of a mig migratory owl in october near okamic marsh but that owl was there just migrating through um, so I wouldn't say that the, the Winnipeg airport would be a prime like location to release owls because it's not really a part of their current range. Um, in years previous, so 50, 60, 70 years ago, Winnipeg was a part of the range, but it's contracted so substantially um, that it's only within the southwestern corner now that we're seeing any wild owls really returning. Um, I, I would have no um, issue for us to expand our program further, but I don't think at this point it would make sense to go further east. I think it would be still, uh, would still make the most sense to stay within southwestern Manitoba, maybe going slightly east, like to where we survey, so like Boisevain area, 
Um, we can go further north a bit to Verdon area, but I would still I would still focus on um, trying to reestablish getting back some solid pairs and, and individuals to that area before extending further out. Great, thank you for that answer. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a listener here um, named Daniel, and he would like to know if you use NCC or Manitoba Habitat Heritage Corporation to sign up conservation agreements. So we actually, uh, had a meeting a couple few meetings last year with mhhc uh, they're doing some great work in southwestern manitoba too um, um installing nest structures and doing surveys on lands for other grassland species um and trying to encourage landowner to and landowners to keep certain areas available for uh threatened and endangered species and other grassland species um so the thing with our program, when I first started uh, doing my research, there was a lot of, I'm going to say, secrecy um, around burrowing owls. I would say that a lot of um, community members and and landowners weren't super keen on on reporting. Um, they had some bad some bad maybe not run-ins, but ideas of um, that if they had owls in the past on their land and then the owls didn't return, it's because the owls were banded or somebody came out to monitor them and things like that. So um, within the community um, around Melita, I would say, and, and southwestern Manitoba, I felt like there was a lot of pushback for um, even telling like telling anybody you had a burrowing owl because people wanted to protect them and and not have come have people come and disturb them necessarily so when we started our stewardship program we wanted to make it completely voluntary and not um, necessarily push any individual or landowner into thinking they had to sign something um, sometimes that's a scary thing for people to sign something um, and think that now they don't have any control and i'm not saying that NCC or MHHC is, is like that at all, but the perception um, has was, was definitely different when I first started this project. I'd say going forward, I think MHHC is doing, yeah, some really great work. And um, I hope that we can work together further and maybe do some more signed agreements with some of our landowners that we have. I, I, had, I had mentioned we have about 40 landowners. We've installed artificial nest burrows on lands and it'd be great to secure and protect those areas. But um, because of that initial um, pushback, I would say, uh, we've always just made it very voluntary for people to participate. And we just want it to be um, interesting to the landowner that they they want you know burrowing owls back on their land and they want to participate but not that there is any um anything that's sort of set in stone that they um have to have to do certain things to their land because some people yeah are, are quite scared about those types of things i don't know if that makes sense but i think that um going forward it would be great to to uh, solidify some of those relationships maybe with with an, uh, an official agreement but that will be in the future thank you for that answer um a listener named marianne would like to know how much time does it take um producers to be part of this program every year and um, is it easier for them to participate without an easement in place Sorry, the start of the question cut out, Caitlin. Could you oh, repeat it? How much time does it take producers to be part of this program every year? Okay. Um, so there's not really a lot of time that it takes for them to be a part of it. So we initially come out and, well, we initially do our surveys and then we find lands that we consider suitable. If you look, or if you think back to that map that I I uh, showed previously, I don't know if I can go back to it here. Here. So we survey all of this, all of this area every year and we go back to some of the spots that are yellow, red, 
um, and green to uh, ensure that they still are in those categories. And then what we do is we talk to the conservation districts and we try to connect with the landowner that way. So we make the call, we go to the, the landowner's home. So it might be an hour meeting with them to talk about some other improvements we could do to their land, um, which would be adding artificial nest burrows generally. And then the landowner can participate with us that the day that we actually do the installs or they don't they don't need to be there either. We'll, we'll recruit volunteers. We sometimes hire contractors to help us with some of the digging, but mostly it's just by hand um, with volunteers. And then annually, we ask landowners to check those burrows. So um, it might be an hour or two, but sometimes, I mean, the landowners we've worked with have said too that they are out in the land anyways, checking on cattle, et cetera, and they can just check the burrows as they go along. So it doesn't really add extra time to their already very busy schedule. And then we just ask that when they're out, that if they, we give them pamphlets uh, with other grassland bird photos too. So if they note any other, you know, sprigs or bits or chestnut colored long spurs or whatever they see on their land that they keep keep a keep track of that. So it's kind of whenever whenever they're out and about doing work anyways, that they can kind of add that to their day. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, a listener named Michael would like to know how far and how fast brewing owls can fly. Oh wow. So um they generally in the breeding season they don't go all that far from their nest so in my study which i did not discuss today but i did look at home range of wild male owls and then also wild or sorry captive release males and uh, the wild males uh, i was surprised that they've stayed within a pretty small area to hunt so within a kilometer of their of their burrow or their nest burrow. Um, as for migration, I have read and heard that there was a burrowing owl back in the early 80s um, that was banded and was noted in Manitoba and then two days later was found in Louisiana. So that was a two day travel for this owl. Um, all that way. So I don't know what the speed would be on that, but that's pretty fast. So um, I think in migration, they're they're moving pretty quickly. That's pretty impressive for such a small bird. It is, yeah. yeah. Um, a listener named Linnea would like to know how sensitive are brewing owls? Like, are they prone to abandon their nest with um, with some disturbance, with minimal disturbance? We haven't noted that. Um, we had wild pairs in 2010, 11, 12, and we did um, actually install an artificial nest burrow after young had hatched in the burrow just to because they were in a natural burrow. And we didn't have any abandonments during that time. And Ken Smet, who is one of my mentors, and he would be the expert on grassland species and species at risk in Manitoba. Um, he, he was involved in the 1987 through 1996 reintroductions and he reported zero abandonments when they switched out a wild nest to an artificial nest burrow. So they seem to be able to uh, deal with um, some disturbance. Uh, I think that Troy Wellcom, who's the head of our national team and also a burning owl expert in Alberta, has mentioned that um, during the egg laying stage, I believe, um, that there shouldn't be any disturbance to the female. So I don't know if he, I wouldn't know offhand um, what he has reported on that, but that might be something to follow up on uh, looking at some of Troy Wellcom's uh, comments on uh, disturbance during egg laying and incubation and um, abandonment. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We have a couple questions about um, the the artificial burrows. So, uh, listener named Tim would like to know what kind of camera equipment is used to monitor the inside of the burrow. Okay, yeah. So the camera we used inside is uh, we purchased from a company in the UK called Wildlife Windows, 
and it's an IR, so infrared camera, and it records um, information or video as much as you want. So you can have it set up um, to only record if there's movement. Um, you can record 24 hours a day. You do, it is not a live feed. So there's the Peregrine Falcon Cam in Manitoba, if anybody's listening from Manitoba and follows the Falcon Cam, but it's not something like that where we can link the video um, to be received uh, and that people can just watch it stream live. So what we do is we have to take out a card daily um, or every couple days out of the, not in the actual borough, but outside we have um, where like the system is recording and then we can load all those videos onto our computer and then we stick the card back in and it's powered by a car battery, which is really great because we're in the middle of a field. We don't have any electricity, of course. So um, the, yeah, the company is called Wildlife Windows and it was, um, we actually received a large donation from the Lady Grail Foundation in Manitoba. And that's what we used the donation from them, uh, them we used to purchase this camera. Awesome. Um, a listener named Christine would like to know, what is the rationale for the narrow diameter weeping tile in the middle? Um, and she notes that the design of this borough is pretty cool. Okay, yeah. So like I said before, this last year, we just used um, the six inch weeping tile for like the eight to 10 foot section. And this last season, or sorry, the season before last, so 2017, we had some nest predation that we were concerned that um, some smaller predators were actually getting down the burrow. We never actually saw the culprit. Unfortunately, our camera, um, of course, that that night that we had um, some nest predation didn't pick up any uh, activity going in and out of the burrow. So we were concerned that maybe something like even like a small weasel or something was getting down there and, and that's what um, what had happened and we just didn't see it on the camera. And because of that, we talked with um, the Calgary Zoo and um, our friends in BC about some ideas on um, changing up the artificial nest burrow. And Calgary Zoo has been using that design. They started their Head Start program in 2017. So they've only had the now two seasons but they haven't had any issues with um like nest predation or any questions about that anything's getting down the burrow so that narrow um making it narrow close to the nest um allows for owls that if they're outside the burrow they see an intruder coming they're all able to pile down quickly down the six inch weeping tile. They're able to get all the way down past the four inch before an intruder could even make its way down part of the six inch. We had thought about putting just one of those couplers that was a four inch on the very entrance, like on the entrance. But what um, another researcher in Oregon, uh, David Johnson, had noted is that because Burrowing owl families can be quite large. They've got two adults and possibly, you know, seven to 10 young. That if you have a small entryway, they all can't make it down quick enough if there's an intruder that comes really quickly, say an avian predator, because larger hawks and owls are an issue for burrowing owls as well. So that's where the idea of putting the four inch further down the pipe um, allows all the owls to get down and then the intruder if it's a mammalian predator, they're not able to get past that four inch. So, and like fingers crossed, like this last year, we had a great year, 2018 was fantastic. And we had no, no issues with predators um, getting down the nest there at all. And it was great. Um, and a listener commented, that makes sense. Thank you very much. Okay, great. <laughs> um, there's another question from a listener named Carol. Um, does a weeping tile create a hazard for young, um, like for young survival in that rain easily flows down the tile and young cannot escape because tile is not condu conducive to grasping as soil would be in a natural environment? Right. So I should have mentioned that our weeping tile is perforated. So uh, there's tiny holes throughout the entire, like along the entire pipe. 
Um, we've actually, because we had four years of the last nine that were so, so wet in southwestern Manitoba, uh, I actually, we did a test with a weeping, with weeping tiles. We poured two five gallon buckets of water down a section of 10 foot weeping tile to see and put it at the same angle. It was in, it was in the ground. Um, we just hadn't covered it up, the artificial nest burrow, and the water didn't make it to the to the actual nest chamber. So when we had issues with flooding in the past, it's the water coming from the ground up. So uh, the ground is so saturated. The ground was so saturated with water that the water table is so high that the water was actually coming up through the nest chamber, not down the weeping tile. Okay. Thank you. Um, hopefully that answers the question there. Um, a listener named Lena would like to know if the adults can exit the enclosure at all for foraging or if you feed them. So they're provided with a supplement of, of mice uh, until there are three eggs in the nest. And then after there's three eggs in the nest, we take down the pen. So the pen is completely gone and they're able to forage on their own for the entire summer. We provide, I did, I did mention, I think that we do provide a supplement throughout the, the summer, but we do reduce it based on uh, observations of hunting abilities of the male and female. If they're, uh, generally it's the male that's the provider because the female is incubating uh, the 28 to 30 days and she's more the protector of the nest and the burrow. Um, so generally it's the male that's coming back and forth with food. So if we notice that he's bringing back a lot of food, we cut back their supplement based on that. And that's based on our personal observations or, uh, camera images. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, a listener named Cindy would like to know if ordinary people can volunteer with your program. Of course. Um, so I mentioned that we have um a website there's an instagram page and then we also have our facebook page our facebook page we post uh, a few times a year when we're going to do digging days so um i would suggest that you go or like our page and then we would uh post on there when we're looking for volunteers to help with our digging days generally those happen at the start of the season so in april and may and then also then in august and september and we also look for volunteers to help us with setup of pens and takedown of pens as well. So we post that as well on our web page or on our uh, Facebook page. Awesome. I think that answers that question. Thank you. <laughs> uh, a listener named Lena would like to know, um, or she said that she heard you had a wild female owl approach one of your enclosures this spring. And could you expand a little bit on that story? Sure. Yeah, that was the excitement of this year. So uh, on June 3rd, um, we had a wild female show up at one of our reintroduction sites. And our most of our pairs had nested at this point. However, this particular, there's a particular male and a female that hadn't nested and the male in that pen was calling and this wild female showed up, was trying to lunge her way into the pen. And it was quite the sight to see. And she was trying to dig at the ground to try and get under the pen as well. So um, initially, our reaction is, oh, one of our owls got out of the pen. Because we don't see burrowing owls just everywhere, right? They're pretty rare. And so we double checked, make sure everybody's in their, in their respective pen with their, their groups. And um, yeah, so she was a wild female. And uh, what we did is we just outfitted a really small little one-way door so she could get into the pen because we wanted to at least band her and get some weights and measurements on her. And so we dug this small little hole under the reintroduction pen and uh, it had like a little piece of chicken wire so she could just go in, push the chicken wire up and then get into the pen. And she was in within half an hour of um, doing this little hole. So at that point, we received approval that we could 
temporarily hold her with this mail because she was so eager to uh, get in there with him and he was calling and he him and the female that were together hadn't nested yet it's june 3rd so we're getting later into the season it's likely she's going to go unmated during the season and it's a wild owl to get you know wild genetics into our group and um that would be fantastic so we received a approval she nested within seven days with the male they had five young uh five eggs five hatched five survived they're they all fledged um so it was a great success story for for yeah for this female owl that found her way to a uh, uh, burrowing owl in this field, and and it was a great success for our program. Wow, that's really awesome. Yeah, it was great. Right on. Um, a listener named Daniel would like to know if there are any current burrowing owl nests on the same quarter section as an oil well. Mm hmm. Yeah. So there. I don't know if, if anybody's familiar with southwestern Manitoba especially the extreme southwest corner. Uh, there's been a lot of oil derricks that have gone up in the last nine years when I've been doing this work. And generally we haven't installed burrows in the same quarter section, like right next to um, an oil derrick. However, we've um, installed burrows in say the next section. Um, so not right in the same section with an oil derrick, but next to it because the habitat still looks um, relatively good. I know that there, there may be some disturbance um, because there would be somebody who periodically checks these oil derricks daily, but we felt like we were for far enough away that, um, that we hoped that if a wild owl turned up there that the habitat still looked good and that that disturbance wouldn't bother them too much. Um, there is, um, just for, for further um, inquiry into that, there's a fellow, uh, Corey Scobie, who did some work in Alberta. This was right when I first started my studies and he was looking at the impacts of oil derricks and oil rate, or yeah, oil derricks on burrowing owl nesting habitat. So that might be something to further look at. And I, I can't um, think of the title of the paper at the moment, but that might be something to look at further too at the impacts and, and what they found in Alberta. Awesome. Thank you for that answer. Mm -hmm. I think that's all the questions that we have for today. So thank you very much, Alex, for the awesome presentation. It was so interesting and I know I got a lot out of it. Um, and thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in. Um, so I just wanted to let everyone know that when you leave the webinar, there will be a quick questionnaire that will pop up. It will just take a minute. And if you don't mind filling that out, that will help us to keep our funding for this Need to Pray speaker series for the future. Um, so with that, have a great day, everyone, and thank you. Thanks again, Alex. Thanks. Are we, are we online now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it will end now. Thank you. Bye. Okay.